Corinthians chapter 2, let's all stand together for a little bit. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, and uh, Brother Matt Crane was here last week. He's with Final Fight Bible Radio, and um, he said something while he was preaching, caught my attention. And he said this, he said, if I was the devil, I would do such and such. Now let me get this out of the way, I am not the devil, okay? All right? And I'm not trying to get too far into the psyche of Satan. That's not the point here. Uh, but I think the Bible does give us some instruction on our enemy. And it's important to understand that you do have one. Uh, look at 2 Corinthians chapter number 2. And um, let, me, uh, let me give you back to verse number 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 2, look at verse 5. And uh, this is about a, a, a man in the church, a brother in Christ who essentially was living in sin, and it was a, a, it was a very uh, bad testimony, and it was such a, a, a wrong thing that the man had not repented of, and he just wanted to act like everything was hunky-dory, and this is not the modern church. This is the early church, by the way, and they meant business for God. And so what they did when that man refused to repent was they said, hey, brother, we love you. We're going to pray for you, but you can't come back till you get this thing right. And so eventually in the second letter of Corinthians, Paul talks about how this guy wants to come back and wants to be restored to God's people. And the message in a nutshell is don't make it so hard when they come back to make it right. Restore such an one in the spirit of meekness. But look if you would at verse number five. But if any have caused grief, he had not grieved me, but in part, that I may not overcharge you all. Sufficient to such a man is this punishment which was inflicted of many. You say, what was inflicted? It was something that we called church discipline, basically, until the man got the thing right. He wasn't allowed to just act like everything was hunky-dory. He had to repent and get it right with God and get it right with God's people. Look at verse 7. So that contrarywise, you ought rather to forgive him and comfort him, lest perhaps such an one, here's what you got to watch for, uh, should be swallowed up with overmuch sorrow. There's a balance to it. You don't make the guy grovel and crawl on his knees and beg to you, listen, if he's saying he's wrong and he's, he's sorry and he wants to be forgiven, allow the man to be restored is what Paul is saying. All right, look if you would at verse 8. Wherefore, I beseech you that you would confirm your love toward him. For to this end also did I write that I might know the proof of you, whether you be obedient in all things. To whom ye forgive anything, I forgive also. For if I forgave anything, to whom I forgave it, for your sakes forgave I it in the person of Christ. Now look at verse 11. Lest Satan should get an advantage of us, for we are not ignorant of his devices. Let's go, Lord, in prayer. Father, this morning we ask for your blessing. Lord, I pray that you would help us to keep our minds and our thoughts and our hearts just stayed on you and stayed on your word. And Lord, I pray that you'd let, let us learn something from this message. Well, I believe that we have an enemy that does craft devices for your people. Lord, he seeks to attack and he seeks to get his foot in. He seeks to just break in any way that he can. Lord, to destroy the work that you're trying to do in the people's lives that are represented here this morning. Lord, I know every single person that's here is in a different place. There may be somebody here that doesn't know what it means to be saved. They may be lost. They need to be born again. I pray they would see that, Lord, ultimately it's much better to have the devil as their enemy than to have you as their enemy. Lord, I pray that today would be the day of their salvation. Lord, for every child of God that's within the sound of my voice, and Lord, I pray that they would understand the gravity of the enemy that we're dealing with, and Lord, that they would just run to you and cling to you, and Lord, help us to fight back. We ask for your grace, and we ask for your help, and we ask for your wisdom and instruction and, and guidance in this message in Jesus' name. Amen. Be seated if you would. Be seated if you would. It says here, we are not ignorant of his devices. You, you need to understand something about the devil. He has a real ministry in your life. And some of you go, no, 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 he's, it's like this guy in a red pajama suit running around, and it's a big joke. It's not a joke. 
The devil is not a joke. Listen, I'm not the preacher that wants to spend six months out of the year talking about our enemy, okay? On the other hand, I'm not the guy that jokes about it and says, we defeated that old, that old uh, cloven foot devil. We, we stomped him down. Listen, you don't, the Bible says that doesn't happen until we're raptured out of here. You've got to battle with sin and with your flesh and with the devil today. And if you're, if you're saved this morning, you need to understand that when you got saved, God took you and adopted you out of Satan's family and made you one of his children. That does not make you, that does not make Satan very happy. He wants to do everything he can. He knows he can't take your soul. He'll take your joy. He'll take your peace. He'll take your, your, your energy. He'll take your focus on Jesus Christ. He'll take your love from the, for the Bible. He'll do everything he can to destroy what God's trying to do in your life. You know, if I was a devil, I'd do certain things to you. Look at John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. John chapter number 10. John chapter 10, look if you would at verse number 9. I am the door. Aren't you glad for the I am statements in the Bible? I am the way, the truth, and the life. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the good shepherd. I like this. I am the door. By me, if any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. I am come that they might have life and that they might have it more abundantly. Let me explain something to you guys. The devil has come for a couple things. He's come to steal what he can, to kill what he can, and to destroy what he can. And, and there's a false sense of security that some Christians have, and it goes like this. Now that I'm saved, the devil can't touch me. Can I say it like this? Now that you're saved, the devil cannot touch the eternal part of you. Thank God for that. He can't touch your soul, but he will, he will dirty up your spirit. He'll get into your mind. He'll get into your heart. He'll get into your flesh. He will destroy whatever he can in this life if you let him. Listen, you are not, you, as a child of God, you are not meant to be a victim. Some Christians live their entire Christian life just constantly getting run over, over and over again. You know what the Bible says? Resist the devil and he'll what? Flee. Flee. You know what that is? That's a bully. Sometimes he needs someone to push back. But if you don't even recognize that it's him there, you can't fight. Listen, there's, there's some things you need to learn about. Look at 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, and I'll say, I'm not trying to be political this morning, but let me say it like this. If you can't call it radical Islamic terrorism, you can't fight it. You say, why? If you have an administration that will not use those words, and guys, let me say this right now. I'm not the guy that says, let's go nuke everybody. There's souls of men who are going to spend eternity in hell. I'd rather see these people get saved. That's not what I'm getting. But what I, what I will tell you this morning is, when you've got someone that cannot call the enemy what it is, you're never going to beat that enemy. Listen, in World War II, there was, no, there was no doubt about what we were doing. We were fighting fascism over there. We were fighting the Nazis. And no one said, well, we don't really want to call them Nazis. We thought we might call them, you know, a different name. Maybe, we, maybe we'll call them that. No, we call them what they are. And we go after them and we defeat them. Listen, in your life, it is no different. If you can identify the, the work and the ministry of the devil in your life, you will never be able to push back and resist him. You'll never have victory. 1 Peter chapter 5, look at verse 8. Be sober. Be vigilant. You know what that means? Be on guard. Christian, anyone that's ever gotten to know me knows I like to have a good time. I like fun. I like to laugh. My daughter was telling me today on the way to church, she goes, Dad, did you know that adults laugh 35 times a day and kids laugh 350 times a day? Oh, that's a terrible statistic. I think some of you old people need to laugh more, amen? <laughs> the Bible says a merry heart doeth good like a medicine. That's good. I like uh, to, to have fun. I like a good time. I like to laugh. But I'll also tell you this, guys. There's a time to be serious. And this is one of those things. 
He says to be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, as a roaring lion, walketh about. What's he doing? Seeking. You know, you ought to be seeking Jesus Christ today. You know, you ought to be seeking the lost today. There's some things you should be seeking. You know what your enemy's seeking? A way to destroy your life. Over there in 1 Thessalonians, uh, turn there real quickly, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. Paul writes his brothers and sisters in Christ in Thessalonica, and he tells them something I think is very important to note. In the same chapter where he honors them and he basically praises them for for their their love for the Word of God and their accepting the Word of God, not as the Word of men, but as is in truth the Word of God that affects you worked in their lives. In that same passage, you know what the Lord, uh, you know what Paul says? 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, look if you would at verse 18. Wherefore, we would have come unto you, even I, Paul, once and again, but, what? You know what what Paul was able to do? He was able to acknowledge the ministry of the devil in his life. Now, when a Christian tells me, I've got no satanic opposition, I've got nothing, I don't know what you're talking about, everything's fine, I never get any pushback, one of two things is going on, all right? And this is all I've got for you. Either you've never made it out of that family into God's family, or you're a Christian that has not realized what God has put you here to do, and you're still just living for self. And I'll tell you, the devil's going to leave you alone. You say, why? Because you're not making an impact. But man, as soon as you say, I want to do something for Jesus Christ, you watch what happens in your life. If I were to ask you this morning, how many of you feel this way? Raise your hand. How many of you feel that, man, it really actually seems like ever since I decided to try to live for God, things have gotten a little bit harder? Yeah. Anybody ever feel that way? Yeah. Right, there's a reason for that. You say, what is that? The devil. You know he knows? He knows he can't have your soul, but man, if he can take everything else that he can get his hands on, he knows he will make you ineffective for Jesus Christ. Do you know how many Christians today, they're not winning people to Jesus Christ? They're not evangelistic. They're not going out and telling you. You say, why? They're barely holding things together. I'm not picking on you. I'm not throwing stones. I'm trying to help you. You know why some of that is? Because your enemy's gotten in your life, and you've got to push him back out. I'm telling you this morning, the devil is a counterfeit. He's a counterfeit lion. You guys remember the Wizard of Oz? You know, courage. You know, the, the lion that's afraid of everything. You know what you have in Jesus Christ? You have the lion of the tribe of Judah. Nothing scares him, Amen. And you know what you have in the devil? You have a counterfeit lion, and he seeks to imitate Jesus Christ. And he tries to roar just like Jesus Christ. And he tries to act like he's got all the power he does, and he doesn't. And yet, in your life, he'll show up looking for a way to get in. And rather than just playing dead and letting him have his way in your life, learn to push back a little bit. You've got, he's, a counterfe- he's got a counterfeit church. He's got a counterfeit bride. There's a counterfeit trinity mentioned in Revelation. A counterfeit gospel. It sounds like this. Do the best you can. Be a good person. Go to church. Get baptized. Give money. Do, 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 do. And maybe at the end of it all, God compares your good with your bad, and hopefully your good outweighs your bad. That's a counterfeit gospel. That's what most people believe today. That is not the gospel from the Bible. The the Bible says Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. The Bible says... He, God, hath made him, Jesus Christ, to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. That is the gospel. If you, get, if you place your faith in Jesus Christ, he will wash your sins away. He will give you the righteousness of his son. He will place you in Christ. It will place Christ in you. There's nothing for you to do outside of receiving that gift. But the devil's really crafty. I'm talking with somebody right now that says, I believe in the teachings of Jesus. I believe that Jesus taught the law, and that if you want to get to heaven, you must keep all the law. Now, you see how close to the truth it is and how far it is at the same time? You say, what is it? That's the devil's work. The devil has a counterfeit ministry. Here's what I'm uh, I'm getting at, guys. He's got to counterfeit everything, and you've got to learn to spot it. And when the devil is working in your life, rather than just play dead, ignore it and hope that it goes away 
or just continue on your jolly way and, 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 and go, Lord, why is this all happening? Maybe the Lord wants you to take the Bible and the discernment from the Holy Spirit of God and go, that's the devil's work, and I'm not going to take it anymore. Through Jesus Christ. You know what the Bible says? The Bible says we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. You guys, you guys are Bible believers, right? You believe the Bible? Do you believe you can conquer the attacks of Satan? <coughs> you believe that? If you believe that this morning, learn, you know what? You can have victory. So many people believe, well, I'm just a sinner. Well, I was just raised this way. Well, it's just the way it is. No, you can fight back. And you can win. Can I say it like this? If I was a devil, you know what I'd do? Number one, I would distract you. I would get your eyes off of things that actually matter. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 7 real quickly. This morning, I'll say it like this. If I was a devil, and I only had a couple opportunities in your life, you know one of the things I'd do? I surely wouldn't show up and go, worship me, I'm the devil. I surely wouldn't say, Jesus Christ is a lie. You know what, if you're saved, you're already past that point. I surely wouldn't uh, show up and say, you know what, uh, uh, these church people, they're all evil, you should just leave church. I would probably just start off with a distraction here, and a distraction over here, and something to get your eyes over here, and something to move your attention over there. I mean, guys, listen, let's even apply this to a church service. How many times has a kid gotten up and gone to the bathroom and everybody goes, have you ever seen a kid go to the bathroom? All right, it's not that cool. It's not that big of a deal. And yet, whenever a kid gets up, he's like, oh. He said, now, let, let's think about that. Why is it that when it, it could be anything else and your attention is, is really not that easily taken away? When it comes to the Bible, there's a spiritual transaction going on where there's a transmitter, all right, not just the preacher, but the Word of God, and there's a receiver on Wednesday night. God bless Brother Justin. He's trying to help me fix this thing. And I'm, go, you know, I'm, I'm just saying, so it's going, and we're going, what in the world is going on with the sound system? And we're talking about it the next day. You know what you got? You got a transmitter. You've got a receiver. If they're not working together, it doesn't work as it ought to. And in your life, there's a transmitter, and you are the receiver. And listen. Oftentimes, the Lord is trying to get through to you, but there's this thing over here, this thing over here, that distraction over here. Got to get to the game. Got to watch the game. Got to do this. Got to make lunch. Got to pay that bill. Got to go here. And listen, I'm not talking about sinful things. I'm just talking about life. Amen. And most Christians today, they are so distracted with just life on this earth that they're no good for eternal stuff. And they're so wrapped up in the here and the now that when it comes to trying to talk about eternal things, it's like there's nothing there. First Corinthians chapter 7, look if you would at verse 35. Now this morning, I'm going to tell you that most of us today do not have the gift that Paul is speaking of in First Corinthians chapter 7. You say, what is that gift? Basically, to be single for your entire life and just live for Jesus Christ. I do not have that gift. Hallelujah. Amen. I'm a mess without my wife. I really am. And I'll tell you what. We're supposed to be going on this trip to pastor school tomorrow. And our house, I mean, you got to read my house. My wife always keeps it spotless. When she's down, I cannot be her. Amen. Not even close. The kids go, Dad, there's something growing out of the food in the fridge. Ah, eat it anyways. It'll be all right. It's okay. I'll give you some character, you know. Their mom would never let that happen. Here's the point. I don't have that gift. Most of us don't have that gift. But Paul did, and he was trying to get something across him. He goes, look, I, I would rather you live this way if you, could, if you could handle it for this reason. Look at verse 35. This I speak for your own profit, not that I may cast a snare upon you, but for that which is comely. I just, re I just realized my daughters, all three of them have that gift. They're never getting married. <laughs> Amen. I just, the Lord just spoke to me in divine utterance, so. <laughs> Hallelujah, what a blessing. That's good. And it's recorded, and it goes on the internet, so you can't get married now. That's, sorry. <laughs> Verse 35, it says this. But for that which is comely, and that ye may attend upon the Lord. Look at this. Without distraction. 
Now, Paul goes on to talk about all the blessings of marriage, and it is a beautiful thing, and God created it. He's not, God is not against it. But he's talking in light of this. He's saying, look, guys, the only reason I, I, I even bring this subject up and the reason I talk about the single life, if you're not married yet, and you, if you have this gift, is because I want you to live, even whether you're single or married, I want you to live as a distracted, free life as possible for Jesus Christ. I remember reading about Yogi Berra and Hank Aaron. Now listen, my knowledge of baseball ends in the early 1900s. You ask me about anybody nowadays, I have no clue. Which I know is weird for a Puerto Rican. I know, I know. I'm just not into baseball. I watch it, and I go, they go, pitch, the pitch is 3-2, pitch. And, yep. And you see, and he's got the knuckleball. He's got a knuckleball. 90 miles an hour. And I'm going, this thing's moving way too slow. <laughs> Give me soccer, give me hockey, give me football, give me something where it goes back and forth. Something is going on versus, you know. I can't, I can't watch it, man. I can't do it. But uh, Yogi Berra, he was the catcher for the Yankees, and Hank Aaron steps up to the plate. He's a great hitter for the Milwaukee Braves at the time. And he gets up, and Yogi Bear, he was one of those guys that would taunt people. And he would do that to get his team riled up, and he would do it just to get into your head if you're on the opposing side. So Hank Aaron gets up there, and Yogi Bear is, you know, saying stuff, and he, he's uh, poking fun at him. And uh, he says, hey, hey, Henry, you're holding the bat wrong. He's down there, doing, hey, Henry, holding the bat wrong, buddy. And he says, you're supposed to hold it so everybody can read the trademark. <laughs> Next pitch comes his way. Snap! Left field. Out. Home run. When he gets back to home play, he goes, I didn't come here to read. <laughs> <laughs> now, you know what's going to go on in your life as a Christian? The devil's going to be speaking to you. He's going to be saying, hey, what about this? And what about this? And what about that? And what about, and you know, you know, there's this person, and there's that relationship, and there's this thing, and there's your job, and, and listen, can I say it like this, guys? I have a job, I understand, I, we all have jobs, that, that's, that's part of life, but the thing that God has given you as a means of, of putting forth the gospel of Jesus Christ, as a vehicle to spread the gospel, as a means of giving God honor and glory, should not become your, your major distraction in life. Some Christians live for their job. Or they live for this, or they live for that. And God has given us these things, and the devil goes, yeah, that, that was from the Lord, but let me see if I can make this a distraction in your life. You need to learn to say, I'm not going to pay attention to all the distractions. I want you to go with me to the Old Testament. Go to Judges chapter 20. There's a really interesting principle. Now, one of the biggest problems we have on the roadways, you know what it is? Distracted drivers, right? People driving, trying to text, people doing videos. They've, they've gotten, you know, people uh, uh, streaming on Facebook, getting into car accidents. Hey, listen, do one thing at a time, amen? It ain't worth it. It is just not worth it. But I read this, 94% of teen drivers acknowledge the dangers of texting and driving, and yet 35% admit to doing it anyways. 11 teenagers in the United States of America die every single day because of it. You, you say, what's the problem? 21% of teen drivers involved in fatal accidents were distracted by their cell phones. What's the problem? You should have your eyes straight ahead. And they say every time you look down for a text or even to mess with your radio or whatever else, and you're going 55 miles an hour, that's basically for you to stop. It's the equivalent of about two football fields. You know what that means? You're in trouble. Your eyes should be going straight ahead. You should be focused on what's in front of you, not even what's behind you, and not always what's on the side, but primarily, my dad taught me, I'll never forget, I was learning how to drive, which I, you know, I have to tell you, I'm a little nervous about going through that process again. Uh, <laughs> But uh, my dad taught me how to drive, and I'll never forget. I was looking at the rearview mirror. He says, why are you looking at the rearview mirror? I said, well, I just want to make sure. He said, you're going to get in an accident that way. He says, unless you are backing up, you need to keep your eyes straight ahead. I thought, man, that stuck with me as a Christian. 
Unless you want to back up, you want to move forward, keep your eyes straight ahead. Don't get distracted. Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20. Interesting thing here. There's this thing called the liars in wait. Some of you that have read through your Bible before, you might go, oh, I remember this story. Well, it goes a little something like this. The Benjamites, they were one of the smallest tribes in all of Israel. And yet they were some of the stealthiest and most ruthless assassins in war. They had trained men who could throw accurately with their left hand. They could use a slingshot and hit the target they were hitting at from hundreds of feet away. Hey, look, that's some serious training. They had allowed some things in their, in their tribe specifically to go on that were wicked and evil. And the rest of the nation, the nation of Israel says, we've got to wipe them out. We've got to show them what they did was wrong. And you know what happens the first time they square off? 11 to 1, or 10 to 1, he says, 1 and a half, if you will. Uh, 10, let's just call it 10 to 1. 10 to 1, and you know who wins? Benjamin. They're outnumbered. You see what happened? They were, razor, they were focused, laser focused on defeating the Israelites, their own people. You know what happens the next day, the next time they fight off, the next time they square off? Israel goes, hey guys, we're not going to beat them. We're not going to beat them the way we normally fight these battles. We've got to come at this a different way. So you know what they do in Judges chapter 20? Look, if you would, at verse number 35. And the Lord smote Benjamin before Israel... And the children of Israel destroyed the Benjamites that day twenty and five thousand and a hundred men. All these drew the sword. You say, how did they do it? Look at verse 36. So the children of Benjamin saw they were smitten, for the men of Israel gave place to the Benjamites, because they trusted unto the liars in wait, which they had set beside Gibeah. And the liars in wait hasted and rushed upon Gibeah, and the liars in wait drew themselves along and smote all the city with the edge of the sword. Now there was an appointed sign between the men of Israel and the liars in wait, that they should make a great flame with smoke rise up out of the city. And when the men of Israel were retired in the battle, in other words, they looked like they were going to be losing again, Benjamin began to smite and kill of the men of Israel about 30 persons. For they said, Surely they are smitten down before us as in the first battle. But when the flame began to arise up out of the city with a, uh, with a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the flame of the city ascended up to heaven. It's like this. Here's the Benjamites. Here's the Israelites. Israel comes in, draws them out, and it looks like Benjamin's winning again, but there's people on the other side of the town, and they come in, and they light the place on fire. Ben, then Benjamin turns around and realizes our city and as they go back to pursue their city, they are overtaken. Thousands die that day. What happened? They were distracted. They got distracted by the Israelites, and they go, oh, we're going to win this like before. And they didn't realize what was going on behind them. Christian, let me say it like this. The devil wants to find a way to get your eyes off of Jesus Christ and off of anything that matters eternally. And he'll use anything he can. And he'll distract you, and he'll get you to leave a place of security. He'll get you to leave a place that the Lord would have you stay. You say, why? So that he can destroy what you have there. And then when you look back, you know what you're going to find? I need to go back home. And home's not the place it used to be because the devil's gotten in. Now, you say, what happens to the tribe of Benjamin? Eventually, they make their way back. But boy, it's a long road. Look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. In 2015, 3,477 people were killed because of distracted driving. 391,000 were injured in accidents. You see, what does the devil want to do in your life? He'll use that spiritual cell phone, so to speak, that, <coughs> that item of distraction. He'll distract you with relationships. He'll distract you with the opinions of other people. He'll distract you with just yourself. He'll distract you with your job, with the cares of this life. How about this? He'll distract you with pop culture. 
You ever notice how everybody just wants to, I, 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 listen, I don't care. I'm not making fun of this. I just thought about this. I was driving to church. The guy's got a man bun. If you like the man bun, fine. I'm not going to say anything against you. That's fine. Your business. All right? But I thought to myself, where did it come from? Someday, at, at one point in time, some guy who's a male model came out and wore this thing. And someone else says, oh, that's now cool. And then he did it. And then someone else goes, oh, I'll do that. And they did it. What am I getting at? Everyone's so consumed with looking and going, oh, that's what's cool. I'll do that too. And it's so funny because the world goes, be your own person. No, you're not. You're doing everything they're telling you to do. And then you come to church and a pastor holds up the Bible and says, be different. You go, I just want to be my own person. No, you're not. You're doing everything they're telling you to do. Listen, if you're going to follow someone's example, listen to Jesus Christ. Mark chapter 4, look at verse 3. Behold, hearken, behold, there went out a sower to sow. And it came to pass, as he sowed, some fell by the wayside, and the fowls of the air came and devoured it up. Look at verse 15, same passage. And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. Can I, can I say it like this, Christian? If you're by the wayside, you're probably already in the wrong place. You know what that means? Instead of being right in the middle of where that seed's about to fall, you go, you know, I think I'll just stand over here. I don't want to be a fanatic. I don't want to be one of those guys that's, you know, Lord, give it to me. Well, I, I think I'll just stand over here and just let a little bit of that seed fall. And, and if a little bit just trickles this way, then I'll be happy with that. That's how a lot of Christians live their lives. And you know what happens when you're in the wayside? It's a lot easier for the stuff that's not supposed to be there to come and just gobble up what God has for you. Look at verse 15. These are they by the wayside where the word is sown, but when they have heard, Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. What is God trying? What, what seeds are the, is the Lord trying to plant in your life right now? And the devil just keeps coming and taking it away. I was talking with Corey and with Brother Sean about this yesterday. Brother Sean. I said, you know... I don't teach that it is doctrine that you have to come to the altar to get things right with God. I don't believe that. But I'll tell you, there is something special and there's something that you remember about getting up out of your seat and going somewhere and having some talks with God. Let me ask it like this way, guys. Let me put it to you this way. When you got saved, did you get saved because you said a prayer or did you get saved because you placed your faith in the finished work of Jesus Christ? Now, why does God say, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved? I think some of that is for your benefit. So that you learn to say, hey, look, I can look back on a place in time where I called on the Lord out of my mouth for my salvation. There's an action involved with your receiving Christ. And you say, what is that? It's a reminder that oftentimes, listen, as a child of God, rather than just being in a place where you go, yeah, you know what, um, I, I'll, I'll take care of that later. I'll do that later. The Lord says, do it now. Don't get so distracted. How many times have you been in church and go, man, I've got to do something about that. Man, I've got to take care of that. And then you walk out and 30 minutes later you go, wait, what was that message about? I'm not throwing stones. I've done it sometimes. What I'm saying is, it's easy to get distracted. And if I were the devil, I'd distract you. Let me say this, if I were the devil, I would divide you from each other. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter number 1. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to find a Bible-believing, Bible-preaching church where people are getting saved, and he wants you to hate each other. Amen. That's what he wants. He wants to find a way in and say, hey, did you see how they said that to you? Do you know, listen, how come preachers shook their hand and not yours? You know, or how come they were asked, how come they're doing that? I wanted to do that. And, and you know what? I noticed last time we had potluck, everybody ate her food, nobody ate mine. <laughs> she always wears that dress when I wear my dress, you know. Now listen, some of this stuff's funny, but can I tell you, there are people out of church today because of stuff like that. And the devil will use stuff like that to divide us. Can I, can I say it like this, guys? The, 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 the most unifying factor in all the world today is Jesus Christ. We've got, we've got black, white, Hispanic, Asian. We've got everything here. You say, why? Jesus Christ. Do you, know, do you know the people that want to destroy our country, they know they can't do it with bombs. They know they can't do it with an enemy from without. You know what they're doing? They're saying, hey, you, 
Hate that person because that's how they look. Hey, you, hate that person. They're the problem with our society. If you can ha everybody hate each other from within, you destroy the body from the inside out. And guys, can I say it like this? The same happens in church. And let me go on and say this. If you are close to anybody in this world, if you're saved, it should be another child of God. You know what the devil will do? He'll give you all kinds of friends and all kinds of relationships. Oh, the devil wouldn't do that. Oh, sure he would. As long as you don't get close to God's people. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Look at verse 10. Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, and that there be no divisions among you but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. Uh, guys, I'll tell you, one of, the, one of the blessings about believing this book is at least we all have the same authority, amen? That helps. But even then, man, I'll tell you what, you get people that believe exactly the same thing, and that's a safeguard, and that's a help toward the right end. But even then... Boy, people get stuff in their mind, and, and the devil will throw a seed of thought in your mind, and he'll say, you know, that person's really, they said they're praying for you, they're not praying for you. Yeah, you know, they said they'd come visit with your talk, they're never going to come. They don't care about you. You know, they, they, say that, they say they believe this, and they say they care about each other, but they don't. And he'll throw that stuff in your mind, and the next time you're lonely, the next time you're struggling, that thing's going to be right there. You know what you should have done? The first thing, time that thing popped in your mind, you should have said, it is written. And you should have responded with Scripture and said, Lord, devil, I don't want the, you're not going to have any place in my mind or my heart. I'm not going to let you divide me from God's people. I'll ask it to you like this. You know the Lord asks a question of his nation in the Old Testament. He says, can two walk together except they be agreed? You know why we constantly, constantly, and sometimes maybe they get annoyed with it. We, get, we talk to the young people and say, look, marry someone that loves Jesus Christ. Because if you don't, you pay for it. Whether you're a female or male, it doesn't matter. I've seen guys do it. I've seen ladies do it. It goes both ways. But here's the thing. Can two walk together except they be agreed? And we see that how, how important that is in marriage. But can I say this? That, that, thing, that principle goes through every part of your life. And if you find that when you're in trouble, you don't talk to God's people. You talk to these folks. And when you're struggling, instead of reaching out to a brother or sister in Christ, you reach out to this person. Or, or when there's a real need in your life, you don't think about uh, church folk. You think about, you go, well, I don't know them. or I don't. Hey, listen, can I say it to you like this? I heard people say this to me. Well, they're not friendly at that church. I go, do, do you ever go introduce yourself to the unfriendly people? <laughs> and maybe make them more friendly? The Bible says, he that hath friends must show himself friendly. So, so here's the point. The idea is, instead of coming in and going, I'm not a part of this. I don't fit in. They don't like me. Say, I'm here. I'm not moving. I'm not going. The Lord's called me here. The devil's trying to rip me out. And unless I die, I'm staying at New Heights Baptist Church. <laughs> Can I tell you this, guys? As a pastor, I'll tell you right now. Unless God calls me somewhere else or I'm dead, I'm here. And let me tell you, I'll go through the history with you. People have said all kinds of things. Oh, no. You're nice. Oh, trust me. You get to know me, you'll learn my flaws. And when some folks do, they go, oh, I don't know about him. And I've, I have people say some hurtful things. I mean, really, really. Now, the older I get, they'll go, oh, well, whatever. What's the chapter of the week, you know? The older you get, you realize they're always going to say something. So I might as well just live for Jesus Christ and enjoy myself and say, devil, I ain't moving. <laughs> Christian, where, what, how resolute are you to just be stuck with God's people? And I mean that in a good way. You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to divide you from the Lord's people. You know what he'll do? He'll go, you know, this Sunday you've got stuff to do. I mean, you know, you've got a trip tomorrow. Your wife's sick and you got this and you got that and you haven't gotten this done. Yesterday... I'm trying to prepare for my message. And, and guys, Saturday's a work day for me. I'm not complaining. I'm just telling you, it's a work day. 
And I love it. And I'm thankful for it. But Saturday's a work day because the rest of the week I'm working the other job. So Saturday I'm studying and I'm going, okay, I got to get my mind on this. My kids got this thing. My wife was going to take him. She's sick. She can't take him. I got to take him. Okay, Lord, help me. And the whole time, you know, I'm playing with the kids and I'm throwing them in the water. I'm swimming with them. I'm going, Lord, if I was the devil, what would I do right now? Help me. I need, this, uh, I need something for my message tomorrow. Give me an illustration. Amen. You know? And, uh, and so anyways, I get to the end of the day, two o'clock in the morning comes around and my wife's hacking along and she can't, she needs help. I'm trying to take care of her. And, and boy, I'll tell you what, there are times where you go, do I really need to be there? Pastor Meyer, you ever had that happen? And you know, all it takes is one time. It gets a little easier the next time, the next time, the next time, the next time. You go, oh no, not with preachers. Yeah, see, that's your problem. You don't understand we're flesh. And I'll, I'll tell you this, this goes for everybody. When you find yourself slipping away from the fellowship of God's people, can I just try to help you out? Get back to it. It's not the work of God in your life. I'll put it to you that way. You know what the devil wants? He wants to isolate you so you can become easy prey. You know, it talks about wolves in sheep's clothing, and even Paul, when he's saying goodbye to the elders at Ephesus, he says, many wolves, grievous wolves, will come in among you and spare not the flock of God. You say, what does the devil want to do? He wants to come in and destroy everything that's going on. You think he's happy that people get saved? You think he's happy that Christians say, people go, you know what? I'm not drinking anymore. They pour it out. You think he's happy with that? You think he's happy with, with, with a Christian that goes, you know what, my family's going to ostracize me because I'm getting baptized, but I'm going to do it anyways. You think the devil's happy with that? He wants to do everything he can to destroy the work of God and rip you away from it. You know, over there in the Old Testament, there's a story about a young man named Amnon. And uh, you might be familiar with it. It says, but Amnon had a friend. And that one relationship ruined his whole life. Now, what did Amnon, he had a choice. You know what Amnon could have done? He could have gotten real close to Daddy and said, Hey, Daddy, David, I'm struggling right now. I want you to be a better friend to me than the friends I've been hanging out with. But he didn't do that. He just kept going down that road. You say what? You have a choice with the people that you allow yourself to get close to. Now, listen to me. For the sake of ministry... I'll talk to anyone. I'll sit down with anyone. I mean, there's, I give you all kinds of examples of times where I've sat down with people and talked to people and, and show them that you love them and care for them and pray with them and be there regardless of how they smell, look, whatever. But when it comes to fellowship and the people that you trust and the people that you pour your heart out to and the people that you are bonded with, are those people God's people? You know what the devil wants to do? He wants to divide you from God's people any way that he can. You guys, there was a movie, I think it's 42, by Jackie Robinson. Anybody know what I'm talking about? And there was a time where he was, uh, he was on second base. He had just made a really, really, really bad play. He messed up. He made an error. He was pretty humiliated. He was sitting there at second base. And at the time, there weren't a lot of black baseball players. He was the first one coming into Major League Baseball. And there he was, and they're saying things, and the crowd's yelling things they shouldn't say, and, they're, and, and he's all by himself. There was a shortstop named Pee Wee on his team. You know what Pee Wee did? Everybody's chanting, and they're jeering at Jackie Robinson. He comes up, sees what's going on, he stops, takes off his glove, puts his arm around Jackie, just looks at the crowd. You see what happened? Everything got real quiet. You know what we need to do for each other? when the crowd is cheering and saying, you can't do it, Christian, and you knew you'd messed up, and you're a hypocrite, and you're a loser, and you're never going to make it, and the devil's out there going, ah, come on, guys, let's go. And he's just lighting, he's just stoking that fire. Some of us need to just grab a hold of that Jackie Robinson and just say, hey, we're with you. You say, why? That unified that team, that one act. We need that in the body of Christ. Can I say it like this? When Elijah says, God, kill me. When Jonah says, God, kill me. You know what you find about both those men at that point in their life? They're by themselves. You are easy prey when you're by yourself. Can I say it like this? God did not intend for you to live the Christian life by yourself. That's why he put the church here. 
2 Corinthians chapter 10. Go there with me if you would. 2 Corinthians chapter 10. Now, because I'm sick, I have to preach slower, so the sermon's going to go a little longer. <coughs> That's my excuse today, anyways. I was at work the other day, and, and uh, you, know, you know, office stuff, and uh, I'm throwing this piece of paper away, and someone's watching me from the corner, and I did, you know, got, I got, the, I got the, the right thing, and I'm, I'm <laughs> extending my arm, and it's just a piece of paper, you know? I'm doing that, and I mean, it was like a mile away. And they start laughing, I go, it's because I'm sick. <laughs> <laughs> So today, if we go along, because I'm not feeling so well. 2 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves with a number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. Look at this. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves, are not wise. If I was the devil, I would dissatisfy you. I would have you constantly look at people that have a better life than you. I would constantly say, hey, do you see what she has? I would make you dissatisfied with your looks, with your wealth, with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with your church, with your job, with your house, with your stuff, with all of it. Because if I can get you dissatisfied, I can get you to go out there seeking something elusively that you hope to eventually find, like the prodigal son. Do you understand before the prodigal son ever went on that journey, his heart had already left a long time ago. Before he ever starts walking in that direction, his heart was already there. You say, why? It wasn't, I just, there's something I'm missing. Hey, listen, if you're lost, you know what me tell you what that thing is? It's Jesus Christ. If you're saved, can I say, it, it, it is not going to be found out in that world. But if I was the devil, I would convince you of that. I, we have a, out where our chickens are at, we've got these ant, fire ants, you know, they, they come, they build these mounds, and they're a pain, man. They are. And we throw, like, my, my wife, God bless her, and my kids, they're like, Dad, we should use diatometrous earth, D-E, or whatever it's called. And, and it's a natural way. I'm like, give me the flamethrower. <laughs> I'm like, I'm not about, I don't want to throw this dust on there and hope that it does some organic thing to kill the ants in the next six weeks. I'm like, give me, when I was a kid, you know what I did, man? Get that. <laughs> you know, that's my way of dealing with that. But anyways, I, you know, there's been times where you, you see you put the poison down in there. And there are times when good ants, not the red ones, they see that, oh, look, the red ones are taking something down to their hole. How come we don't have that? <laughs> and then you watch these little black ants come over, and they start taking stuff back. I'm going, you idiot, you're going to kill yourself. <laughs> you know what that is? That's you when you're constantly looking at what somebody else has, thinking, got to have that. Christian, you know, you know how many Christians are not serving God, not in church, not right. Their families are busted up. You say, why? Because they felt they were missing something. Yeah. Well, if you knew my wife, well, let me, let me say it to you like this, man. Don't get too high there, Tonto. You know, some, I've, I've seen guys that go, well, you know, she's a little heavy. I'm going, dude, have you looked at yourself in the mirror? <laughs> you know, well, you don't understand. My husband doesn't love me. He doesn't, he doesn't listen to me. But this guy at work does. Listen, I, I can empathize, but I'll tell you, be very careful. Be very careful. You see, what is that? That's not God's work. Benjamin Franklin says, contentment makes poor men rich, and discontentment makes rich men poor. You look in your Old Testament, you see Ahab. He's the king. He's got everything he wants. He's got a wife that would kill for him, literally. I mean, He's got everything that a man would want, and yet he looks and he goes, what don't I have? What don't I have? You know what he's doing? I know what, if he was in modern times, you know what he's doing? Scrolling through his Facebook feed. Oh, how come? Their house looks bigger. Oh, they redid their kitchen. I wonder how they had the money to do that. I wonder if they even tithe. Oh, nice new car. You know, I always wanted that car. How come they have that car? And Ahab is scrolling through the feed, and he's looking at his Instagram feed, and he goes, oh, man, Naboth's vineyard. That is beautiful. And as he's talking to himself, someone over here is going to go, oh, king, but yours is more beautiful, and yours is more, is yours is larger. Yeah, but that one, I, I like that one. Well, aren't you happy, king? With No, 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 listen, I like mine, but I don't think he deserves that one. I deserve that one. 
See what his problem? Dissatisfied. He pays for it in the end, guys. He dies a fool, a fool's death. And his wife, boy, she pays for it too. You see, where does it come from? Dissatisfaction. And you know, sometimes it's not even a, a, a material thing. Sometimes it's a relationship. You look at a relationship, you go, how come I can't have that? Instead of going, Lord, when I have this thing inside of me that I know is not from you, and there's only a couple of alternative sources from which it came, Lord, that gap that I'm feeling in my life, I want to find it in you. The relationship, the friendship, the wealth, Lord, instead of being so focused on material things, Lord, would you help me to gain some crowns at the judgment seat of Christ? Lord, would you help me get my mind on eternal riches? I want to have something to, to show for my entire Christian life when I get to the other side. You see, what is that? Instead of constantly being dissatisfied with what you have, you find satisfaction in Jesus Christ. Amen. David says it like this, As for me, I will behold thy face in righteousness. I shall be satisfied. When I awake with thy likeness. Can you be satisfied with the greatest thing that ever happened to you? It's funny. We say Jesus is the best thing that ever happened to me. Are you satisfied with him? You say, how do you know? Well, what consumes your mind? I mean, guys are just as bad as the ladies are. And guys go, I got to have the truck, and I got to have the boat, and I got to have this, and I got to have that. And I got... Why? Because they got it. Well, I've got to have it. And you say, well, you know what you're doing. You will skim on things that you've committed to God so you can buy something on credit that you don't actually have and make yourself feel better about a boat that really, if the bank said, I'm calling all the money in right now, it wasn't yours at all. Yeah. And people live that way. Can I say this? Be satisfied with Jesus. If I was the devil, I would dissatisfy. If I was the devil, I would delay you. You know, I'd say this morning, I would whisper in your ear, everything he's saying is right. You should listen. And you should do that. And you know that feeling from the Holy Spirit? The devil puts his arm around you. Yeah, that's, that's the Holy Spirit. He's, he's telling you that, and that is true, and that is right. And you should take care of that. And you know what? You should go to the altar next Sunday. Next Sunday, yeah. And you should take care of that. Yeah, that, that issue between you and the Lord, you should take care of that, but just... You don't need to do it now. You can do it tomorrow. You know what it says? Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. I've talked to people who know that they're lost. They know that Jesus Christ is the only way to be saved. They understand that they need to place their faith. They need to turn from their own righteousness to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. They know all of that. And you know what they say? I'll do that later. Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 2. For he, hath, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation have I secured thee. That means helped you. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. You know, when you're talking to somebody about the gospel, you're not usually, the approach you should take is not this. Yeah, you should get saved someday. It's a good idea, you know. You know what you want? You don't, you don't want to force it. You don't want to manipulate it, but you want to express them. Look, I don't know what tomorrow holds. You don't know what tomorrow holds. You know that you're lost. If you die right now without Christ, you go to hell. You should take care of this. It's kind of a big deal. Can I say it like this? If I was the devil, I'd tell you, read your Bible tomorrow. Tithe tomorrow. Tell somebody about Jesus tomorrow. Get that relationship right tomorrow. Quit that sin tomorrow. Make an impact for Jesus Christ in this world tomorrow. You say, why? Because if I was the devil, I wouldn't just delay you. I would be deceiving you into making you think that you have all the tomorrows that you want. You know what the Bible says? Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. Christian, what is it that the Lord wants in your life that the devil's trying to steal and to kill 
and to destroy. General Dwight Eisenhower said this, there are no victories at discount prices. The devil loses in the end. You know that, right? He gets thrown to the lake of fire. Boy, I like that song. The tempter will be banished. We'll lay our burdens down. I look forward to that day. But until then, can I say this? You have a real enemy. And you know what you can do? You can resist him, and you can overcome him through Jesus Christ. Let's all stand.